I must have had 30 dentists in my life tell me I was a mouth breather. Not one person ever was like, you have the job of a five-year-old. So now we're stuck with these pipes of children and we wonder why we burn out at 36. If you could give your kid a chance at being healthier by doing a few of these things, why wouldn't you? Your Instagram account is called Project Airway. Why is Airway important? And how did you come to understand this on a personal level? I think for my own health journey, you know, I've been in fitness for 25 years. So I think it was something that's talked about, I think, at every level, both in school as well as, you know, just professionally with any clients. I mean, people understand that breathing matters, but I think when it came back to my own journey, I really started to understand like how much our nervous system and our long-term health is tethered to sleep and our ability to breathe well. And I think society just isn't taught that it's as serious an issue as it is if someone lacks the ability to breathe appropriately. And I think even some of the secondary and tertiary issues related to someone that just can't nasal breathe is huge. And the world knows sleep, breathing issues, but it doesn't understand that when I can't keep my tongue up, what it does to my nervous system, what it does to where my body thinks it is in space, that my tongue not fitting on my palate affects my posture for the rest of the life. And then my posture moves as a result of my tongue not being up. And then, you know, this is the work of Postural Restoration Institute. My, my posture shifts to accommodate not being able to balance my head over my midline. And then everything in my body is biased for the rest of my life from my muscles, my tendons, and then the access I have to my lungs and my diaphragm, which allows me to kind of get like that piston effect of the ribs and pelvis. And so I think part of this kind of started to come into play when probably like seven, eight years ago, we started working with more and more high level athletes from a professional perspective. And I think that tied right back into my personal journey of me dealing with chronic fatigue and brain fog and starting in the medical system looking for answers and then realizing that there are these other things that weren't really addressed from a medical standpoint. And this is where I started going down wormholes, understanding the depth and complexity of what breathing well means and why it matters. And this is kind of how it all came back and kind of became Project Airway. <laughs> So what you just said there, like what, what does breathing, good, good breathing look like? Can you describe some of that and then, and then how it translates to a, like a healthy body or a fully functioning body? I think first and foremost, I think from like a first principle standpoint, when it comes to health, breathing is at the very top of the list. And there's many distinctions within that world, but the most important being nasal breathing because a few things start to happen. When my tongue can sit on my palate, I have the opportunity to have good posture. And the posture dictates the mechanics I have to be able to use when trying to breathe, whether I'm sleeping, whether I'm in the gym, whether I'm sitting at my desk at work. And modern day, we have these stresses that add to people just being wound up from a nervous system perspective. And the ability to nasal breathe does a few things for us. One, it allows us to slow things down so we can control our mental state with our breathing, which is huge. The tongue on the palate, we have a, we have an autom autonomic nervous system, sympathetic being like the gas, parasympathetic being the brake system. And one of the most important things is the tongue being on the palate actually gives us access to the rebalancing 
the slowing down of our nervous system. So the tongue bee on the palate is basically forward feeding into basically our nervous system, allowing us to calm things down. When we breathe through the nose versus the mouth, we slow down the process. We don't breathe this often. When we don't breathe this often, and we are able to sustain higher levels of carbon dioxide, it allows us to utilize more oxygen in each breath because we're slowing things down. So from a societal standpoint, if we start to overbreathe, we end up blowing off too much CO2. And as a result, we have to breathe more often because when we do breathe, we can't utilize all that we have from an efficiency standpoint. So we lose efficiency first and foremost. And then we lose efficiency when it comes to the mechanics we have access to when we are breathing because of how our posture is as a result of whether our tongue's in a good place or not. And the tongue being up on the palate versus being down low. When the tongue comes down, this is often where I can't support the weight of my head. So my body, instead of like my head sitting over my pelvis where everything is nice and stacked, it plays this human Jenga game. And when I compromise this, I lose access to my diaphragm, which sits like a piston between my, this, if this is my pelvic floor, my rib cage. It basically is like a syringe where as I inhale, exhale, I have access well, when I lose the tongue on the palate and the posture goes out the window, I lose access to this diaphragm. And then as a result, I'm left with this disgruntled, poor mechanics to try and breathe, coupled with the fact that I am breathing faster and I don't have my tongue on the palate to get parasympathetic rebalancing of my nervous system. So all of a sudden, this one thing becomes these three components that take our ability to breathe and health the other direction for something as seemingly as simple as my tongue's not up on the palate, if that makes sense. Yeah, it it does. And it's, I mean, that was an amazing explanation. I think anyone listening might want to go replay that two or three times because that's one of the more concise, thorough explanations I've heard. How did you start to learn about this? Can you talk about the chronic fatigue and some of the exploration you did to to understand this comprehensive picture? I think it started when I was like right around 30, 31, where about Looking back, about four years prior to that, I had broken my jaw playing hockey. I basically got hit in the boards, concussion. I had an internal retainer, fell out, had my jaw wired shut for six weeks. And essentially, when they took that off, I literally paced myself back in to be able to eat normal foods, but they didn't do any PT. (laughs) Looking back now, it's like, My teeth had moved a little bit, so they put me back in some clear aligners to move my teeth, and then I felt like I was left in that pattern. And what I think happened was the result of a a nervous system that basically had a straitjacket put on it because I think when it comes to braces, a lot of people, especially in the dentistry orthodontic world, like they don't understand because they're not taught in school that like we have the teeth with our bite and our occlusion. We have the TMJ joints and then we have our cervical spine. And I think those three components need to be balanced almost like a three-sided table. And if that three-sided table was level, if I put it sideways, if I put a marble, it should sit in the middle. But that system is really dependent as far as working well for my nervous system to function properly. And I think in orthodontics especially, if someone just straightens your teeth and doesn't account for the TMJ joints, it's like one side of the three-sided table looks great to the outside, but behind closed doors, it's like the TMJ joints and the spine are not in a good place. And then as a result, like the nervous system is locked into that pattern. And I think, you know, from everything I've read, there's a lot of things from, you know, 
the body thinks it's one place and it's actually somewhere else. So you're getting this interference or bad feedback back to the brain. If you're locked in a pattern, you have the inability to go somewhere else, meaning the body can't do some of the things that it wants to do if it had its way in things. And so when it comes back to my story, I think part of this was you think of your eyes, your balance, where you think you are in space. And it's kind of like a puppet. If you took a puppet that was perfectly neutral and you started to spin it and then all of a sudden you stopped the strings and you didn't let it move anymore. When I say locked in a pattern, it's kind of what happens to our body at some point. So we can't access things the way we're meant to. And then you start to develop issues only like you said, it doesn't just show up right away. It's kind of like mold behind a a small leak in a sink. And then someday you got some crazy flood in your house and then you pull stuff off the walls and you realize like the entire wall is covered in mold. And it's kind of like a nervous system is that it's this invisible thing that oftentimes a lot of the research I've read, like there's no conscious awareness that there's an issue going on. So there's this covert signaling within the body that there's an issue only we don't know. And especially in the world of medicine today, we don't really know how to test for it. And so I think you take a nervous system that's not happy And then you take someone that already is predisposed because I was a mouth breather since I was born. I mean, two months old, I wasn't breastfed, asthma attacks. So you take a system that already doesn't sleep, that's sympathetically driven, and then we're going to throw this bias from a nervous system perspective. And it's like this perfect storm. And then I feel like for myself, I was at this pinnacle of my life, girlfriend, I think I did 12 house sales in real estate that year. We had me and my business partner now, it's opened like the largest lifetime fitness in the country. So it was all these good things, but like I hit this wall, I think, because for the first time in my life, I couldn't sustain it all. And I think there's this dip in age. I think there's the your body can't compensate anymore or stops or you hit like a limit. And it's like all these things kind of happened. And for me, it was right around 30, 31, where I started to experience brain fog and fatigue. And then little by little, it just kind of was like this slow downhill as far as looking for answers. And I find your story so fascinating because you're this, you know, you uh, have have a gym owner, you're, you're training professional golfers, professional athletes, and at the same time, weekly, you're having moms all around the world message you because they're concerned about their kids and trying to get help for their kids who have health issues. So this isn't something that just starts in the 30s like you and I had. Now, maybe that's when it can manifest for some some people. But can you talk a little bit about why at a young age this is important and what some of these uh, mothers are concerned about? First and foremost, I think there's a lot of parents that are like you or I that literally just they suffer personally and have become aware of this thing. And I think the best thing to happen to the world of medicine and people looking for answers for health is social media. I think uh, it can be the downfall of society in many ways, but I think for those looking for answers, I think there's no place in the world where, you know, Instead of a Jake Paul, you can reach out to the best sleep doctor in the world and they have 2,000 followers and you can DM them. (laughs) And you have the ability to talk to the world's experts in any field. I could name like 10 that are like the best in the world at what they do and they have less than 10,000 followers and you can message them. And you're like, dude, this is awesome. So I think there's this awareness through social media that there's this issue. And then I think there's these wormholes with entire societies of people that have had success in this world and these little communities that have formed. And then I think through that, like moms became aware that like, hey, this is, this is a thing. And then I think with that, 
you have these parents that are like, I'm going to make sure this doesn't happen to my child. And this is where it's kind of been teed up from a societal standpoint. And I think because of the technology and just the awareness, you know, 60 to 70% of your facial development is done by age four. So there's a small window and getting it right early on, right out the gate is huge. And I think the most important thing is we used to have things in our favor so well that like, even if we didn't do a few things, everyone would just kind of be okay. And I think today it's more the other way that like, even if your parents get it right in all the ways that they're proactively trying, that I would still encourage most to probably still use some of these other things to help give their kids an advantage because we no longer can get to the places we once did based on our current environment. And I'm not saying people can't be healthy, but like if you could give your kid a chance at being healthier by doing a few of these things, like at the cost of not really causing any trauma to their bodies, why wouldn't you? And it's more like there's uh, there's philosophies out there regards to like, let's call it a thousand years ago, where most humans were all over the world, male, female, it didn't matter, versus where we are today. And people are just chasing philosophies because I think this is new science. But based on that, I think the last five to 10 years, there's people out there like, hey, like we need to change this. And I think there's some people that wait for medical journals to come out. And then some people that like they don't need papers to realize 50 years ago, seatbelts were a good idea or smoking in a car next to your kids isn't good for your kids. (laughs) So I think there's multiple camps, but I think those out there leading the way are going to be called crazy until it's the norms of society. But uh, that's what I found myself too. Is like you you go searching for answers. Like I can't wait around for papers or or even for you know the next step, which is in the papers becoming widely accepted. So I, I I went looking for who is really getting results, and then you know find also finding persons that I resonated with, and I'm like I'm gonna go work with them. I don't you know I don't care. I'll fly here. I'll fly there. And I went all over the place doing that. And, um. The results were varied. You know, unfortunately, there is no silver bullet usually. So there's no guarantee, but everyone was a step on the journey. Let's go to how does this start? I want to tie it back to where the, you know, the kids are affected and how this can lead. We, where we left off is like something as seemingly innocuous as the tongue can be a little bit out of place. And then that's going to affect huge, huge downstream effects. So how's the tongue? get out of place can you for anyone doesn't know what we mean by palate can you explain what that is and how does that start to to shift the whole body and and eventually nervous system yeah i think from uh how we got here perspective i think at some point like there was a famous doctor that did all these research articles back in the 70s 80s uh harvold what he did with like recess monkeys And what he found was he would plug the monkey's noses with silicone to see what happened. And what he found mimicked very much what we see today with kids, which is the minute the nasal resistance is too high and someone can't breathe through their nose, the tongue is going to come down as a kickstand. The kickstand is going to hold the mouth open as a secondary method for breathing. From an optimal standpoint, the brain wouldn't choose that, but our reptilian brain is like, first and foremost, we're going to stay alive. So um, her Instagram is the nose knows, but Dr. Karen Parker, she's taught me a lot about just the perspective. It all goes back to the nose and nasal resistance, nasal resistance being your pipes, right? Like our body is like a vacuum. And the nose is the pipes. So it's the width of the nose, the strength of the pump, the rigidity of the the pipes, because I think there's the other side of things where you might have something that's really solid versus you got this flimsy straw. And so 
when we put two humans next to each other, understanding what genetics allows someone to do, the rigidity of the pipes, the integrity of the pipes, all these things matter. So it's like you can't compare A to B visually and understand that like, hey, this is how this person breathes relative to this person. But all these factors just add up good or bad. And I think early on, sometime probably just around the industrial revolution, like we just started changing a lot of things from soil quality, making stuff in factory, not breastfeeding kids, softer foods, nutrient quality. And all these things created this perfect storm where we just weren't developing optimally. And somewhere along the way, I look at like a, if you take like a modern day car and you take like the pipes, you know, as the car gets bigger, you need bigger pipes and a better engine. Well, for a child, like their the body or the size of the car is getting bigger and bigger. Now, if the ability for the pump to grow and the pipes to grow with it is not staying even, it's not going to be able to sustain its job. And this is where nasal breathing is something where if I can't do the work necessary to support the vehicle that I am and my tongue comes down, I basically am going to switch to mouth breathing. And this is where oftentimes where people have a hard time getting back to nasal breathing because the the size of the vehicle is continuing to grow. Well, if I don't have an intervention that's going to close that gap from when parent realizes there's an issue to like get them back ahead of the growth of the vehicle, I'm stuck mouth breathing because I can't do what's necessary. And this is what's important when it comes back to breathing for these kids is, is that I need the tongue on the palate because the tongue on the palate is the plow that basically gets the airway to grow being the, you know, if you take the skeleton, right? You've got the palate. So the tongue basically sits on this. Front of the tongue sits right behind the front teeth, like maybe the thickness of a business card or two. So it's not quite touching because then I'd be pushing the teeth outward. But the tongue is going to sit here on the hard palate. And then just shy of the hard palate, we have the soft palate back here. So if I was to take my tongue, let's just say this is a tip, and I put a dime in the back of my tongue, the tongue almost in essence wants to push up. Like I'm trying to stamp the dime into some soft wax up here on the soft palate. So when the back of the tongue the comes up- The dime would be at the very back? Back of the tongue. So when I would push the tongue up, it basically gives me the back of the tongue and then the front of the tongue. Well, the back of the tongue is going to be huge as far as the tongue basically has this freedom that sits in between. And this is where you almost get this forklift effect, right? Where the basically the tongue sits on the palate and then the suction, I've got this ability to create this forklift. So my head is always supported and my tongue sits on the palate. The minute my tongue comes down, I am no longer able to support the weight of my head. And therefore, the forces in my mouth, I call it like a snowball, right? The pressure in your oral cavity and your sinus cavity is like this snowball. And as I grow the snowball, I should be able to sustain more and more pressure. And then what ends up happening is if the pressure stays like this, the bone is going to grow layer by layer on top of the snowball. So essentially, as I develop, the snowball should get bigger, which is how I develop the scaffolding and the framework for my face by the time I'm done developing. But if I don't have the pressure in which to build bone on top of I now have a collapsed structure and I have nothing to put bone on. So therefore, there's nothing to build off of. So the minute my tongue comes down, I'm stuck with the age of a face of whatever. So for myself, at 45 years old, I had the jaw of a five-year-old. I must have had 30 dentists in my life tell me I was a mouth breather. Not one person ever was like, yeah, 
you have the jaw of a five-year-old, of course you get strep throat every year. Of course you're a mouth breather. Of course you have asthma and allergies. Is that from the stress nervous system and then just the body doesn't operate as well and these things get in and happen or is there some other direct correlation? I think there's a, there's a few things. There's the, you know, if you get sick at a young age, right? I grew up on the East Coast. So it was like Boston. I know my house had like mold, horrible weather. So at some point early on, the nervous system get taxed. You can have a nervous system that gets like sensitized. And then it's just like almost like everything in your life can, you can be predisposed to all these things coupled with the fact that you can't breathe. You don't have optimal food from an epigenetic signaling standpoint. It's like all these things that aren't working. I mean, I went camping with uh, two of my employees, my business partner a few weeks ago, and we were joking about how none of us growing up, like from our dads, like none of us had, we ate healthy fat as kids. Olive oil, avocado. I mean, I had zero fat when I was a kid. (laughs) And then thinking about like how your vitamin A, D, K2 are like these basically secret passageways to let like 400 critical micronutrients in the body and how a lot of these fat-soluble vitamins can't get into your system because you're not giving the gatekeeper to the body to where it can utilize it and like there's so many of these little things and we just grew up no one knew this stuff versus like where we are today so basically you were saying like the the tongue is up on the the top of the mouth and that creates a pressure and that pressure then allows for bone formation and facial formation and when the, the tongue drops down that pressure is not there so it's not going to develop the same way and um is, is that what that does that make the pipes the piping not big enough wide enough strong enough to to make nasal breathing in difficult like some point later in life yeah so essentially the roof basically of the mouth is the floor of the nose so i think one of the other important things is if you take like the roof of the mouth basically being here, right? The tongue almost keeps the palate. So if you think of your nose like a tent, right? I need stable ground underneath the tent. If the floor is dropping from under your tent, what ends up happening? And what we don't realize is the palate ends up folding. So what basically was once a nice tent, it literally folds up. So then my nose gets even smaller. Because my tongue essentially, let's just say this. If you imagine your tent, the bottom wants to come up. The only way it can stay down is the tongue is up on the roof of the mouth. So it pulls, basically it holds the the bottom of the tent down. That's how I like pull everything nice and tight across the bottom of the tent. If the tongue comes down, the tent just wants to fold up and condense. And so now I've lost the ability to breathe well. And this is where the tongue not being on the palate, literally the the nose will literally just kind of start to do this, right? And this is how you get a higher arch palate. So you have a tongue that can't hold on the palate and then the nose goes up and your palate that should be nice, solid and flat, it starts bowing up because you can't keep the tent down. Does that make sense? So it's like someone is basically sitting on the side of your tent. They're like, just kidding. I'm going to push it in from the side. And then it's just like, you've lost, you've lost width. And the width of your tent is basically the width of your jaw, which we, a lot of us have lost. Losing the width of your jaw changes the width of the holes, which are our pipes. So now we're stuck with these pipes of children as adults trying to run a V10 engine and we wonder why we burn out at 36. So so I can you could see why parents are on top of this, right? Cuz I imagine the best time to make these adjustments probably the earlier the better when it's indicated cuz the kids are growing and and can fill in um, if someone has this or a child has it what what are 
interventions they could start to look at or, or maybe before the interventions they need to go see specialists and experts i know you have a just a wide range of experience with the experts out there but where would a person start to look into and and make changes if they need to i think my first piece of advice would be this the issue of going down the street tends to be a philosophy that might not be shared with some of the best And I think a lot of the best in the world start super early, two, three, four years old with kids. So the issue with going down the street may be that I had a post today from a mom that told me that like it was too early for her seven-year-old to get expanded. And I could tell you probably the best woman in the United States, Dr. Courtney Donka, she's out of Chicago that does all kinds of pediatric expansion. She expanded her daughter was, I think, four and a half. Her daughter was already, she did everything possibly right. Her daughter was 32 millimeters across the, basically, the width of her inner molar. She expanded her daughter at four and a half years old. Before she was five, she was 38 millimeters. So this little girl had a bigger jaw than every one of my trainers at my gym. However, this girl is doing myofunctional therapy, all this stuff, and I'll bet you she's possibly expanded again when she's maybe 9 or 10 years old before her adult lower teeth fully erupt to where she might actually be able to keep her wisdom teeth by the time she's 18 years old because I think roughly a kid has to be able to get at least 45 millimeters by the time they're 18 to have a shot at having enough space for their wisdom teeth. So I'd say there's Dr. Courtney Donko in Chicago, and then there's a Dr. Marisa Santos in Buenos Aires. She runs a school of orthodontics, but she expands all three, four, and five-year-olds that come through the door. For the most part, they get expanded. They do 90 days of myofunctional therapy, and then they come back in a year. And as long as they're nasal breathing, they're good to go. If they're not, she expands them again. The name of the game is if your kid isn't nasal breathing, they already have a problem. So let's just say those are the opinions of who I think after spending every day of my life the last five years in this world, like trying to understand how you would give parents the best advice, the best shot at little Jimmy and Sally being healthy. These are two people leading the way from a kid perspective. And then I think down the street, you might find people that are like, hey, we do four-year-olds, we do five-year-olds. And I think more so it's people being comfortable because when you're used to dealing with 12-year-olds and all of a sudden you got to deal with a three-year-old, a four-year-old, it's a way different game as far as getting something in their mouth, having them be compliant. And this is where Dr. Courtney is amazing because... She talks about how she does all kinds of different types of expansion based on who the child is. You know, you got a three-year-old's mouth, you got adult fingers, you literally can't get your fingers in their mouth. So having expanders that allow you to do what you need to do as a doctor. But I look at someone like her, like I look at myself in the gym, kettlebells, TRX, Pilates, yoga, dumbbells. It doesn't matter. It's all just, they're just tools to help. And then I think you have some of these people that are just getting into this field. They might have been orthodontists for 10, 20 years, but, you know, working with four and five-year-olds is not what they're used to. And so these people are playing catch-up. And I think you'll have people sometimes that don't know what to do. So when when they don't feel good about it, most doctors won't tell you that they don't know. So it might be a, hey, maybe we should wait. And this is where I tell parents that like when in doubt, like get on a plane like you did in your own journey, like I did. Um, For those that are on the cusp, I think first and foremost, it's like educating yourself and tuning into what some of these great minds think, because I think then you have some education and perspective. And I think with that and awareness comes conviction and kind of taking some action when it comes to your kids. And then... I think once you understand enough, now you can start to vet the doctors down the street or maybe two hours away and you can kind of 
play the game of how serious is this for my child? Where are they? What do I need to do? What can I afford to do? And I would say there's that side. And I would always tell people to sit in front of a pediatric airway orthodontist that really understands this game and just listen. You don't have to do anything, but why would you not want someone that's really good to at least give you perspective? It's like, don't go see the JV quarterback for the high school, like when you can get on a plane and talk to Tom Brady. (laughs) But I think it's like getting that expert advice because often what you're going to get there is not going to be in your backyard. And then based on what you hear, at least you can take that opinion back home and try to figure out the best to your ability, like what you can do for your child. And I think the other side of that is doing some homework and finding a really good myofunctional therapist. Because I think, you know, you have these three things. I think you have, uh, let's call it four. So I think you have the ENT, which is very important because I think you've got tonsils, adenoids, allergies that are a major factor. If a child already is dealing with allergies, I think there's that component. And then I think you have the myofunctional therapist that's going to help evaluate whether your child literally just has a physical limitation when it comes to their tongue, lips, whether it's pressure, whether it's muscular issue. And then I think you've got the pediatric orthodontist, pediatric airway dentist. Um, But like having a solid team. But I think that gives parents at least a good idea. And like, yeah, I get it. Like for a lot of parents, they're going to hear this and be like, dude, that's so much. And it's like, well, I understand having been dropped in it my own life. But I think at the end of the day, you know, parents can read three or four good books, listen to a few podcasts, and let's just call it 15, 20 hours of their time. They can kind of have a good understanding at least to where they can start to take some action. What about if um, someone's not at, you know, a two, three, four year old, what do older kids do? And even, even adults, what's, uh, is it the same, same option, same path? Does order matter? I think I heard you speak about, you would have done an order differently with, with the myofunctional therapy you did in terms of other procedures. How do you, how do you currently see it? I think it's interesting, right? Like we have a medical system. So if you can't have your tongue on your palate, the tent pole that sits in the middle of our nose, our septum, like how is that supposed to not be bent? And then I always laughed at like people contextually would be like, well, I had a, I had a deviated septum. Well, it's like, well, yeah, you're a mouth breather. Like I would expect your tent to be bent. And why would you fix it when you come out of, the surgery, and then you still can't put your tongue on the palate. You essentially have a tent that keeps collapsing. So what's funny to me is that we have a system medically that would pay for a surgery like that, but like palate expansion is cheaper. And the very essence of a deviated septum surgery is like, they're just going to go back to their tent collapsing because they lack the mechanics from their tongue and their oral cavity to even sustain keeping that. Yet, they won't cover fixing the tent. And I think every person, there's like an order of operation, I think, relative to if they were to meet with someone that really understands the big picture relative to like possible treatments and then their situation. I think one of the big things is because someone doesn't tend to quarterback it all for a client, or, you know, someone from a health perspective is that you might have one doctor telling you need one thing, you have a different doctor telling you another. So prime example would be, this is my surgeon that did my Sarpy. He said, if you start with an orthodontist, they'll probably tell you to get expansion. You start with, start with an MMA surgeon, they'll tell you you need MMA. So here you have the same person, and if you were to get an opinion from both, now you're like, well, do I really need MMA? Is doing expansion good enough? And this is where I think people just get paralyzed. This was the hardest thing for myself was I like 
chased cases from different great doctors to kind of start to understand all these nuanced things that would maybe make a doctor say you should get this versus you should get this from like an MMA versus expansion. And even then it was like, I just needed to understand enough variables to start to comprehend why certain people would be told A versus B if they got multiple opinions. And then, then it became starting to understand the distinctions based on like all the different procedures from an expansion. Like not all expanders are the same. There are, there are those that are like a tooth born, like a Sarpy, like I had, which is like old school. And then you have like the ease procedure, Dr. Casey Lee, the mind procedure at the Breathe Institute, which is bone born, much heavy duty, much more heavy duty as far as like from an appliance perspective. But like what that does from a expansion perspective. And at the end of the day, when we're testing nasal resistance from a flow perspective, it's not, we're not chasing dimensions, we're chasing flow. Because at the end of the day, if I had a little hose, but it shot out like a fire truck, it wouldn't matter. But it's kind of one of those things where if I expect a fire truck hose to perform like that, and it, it performs like my hose in my backyard, I got a problem. And this is where it's like trying, it's like understanding where someone is from a testing perspective relative to where like a healthy norm. That's the other thing is, well, if most people are mouth breathers, who are we comparing my child to? <laughs> and this is where it's like, I want to compare my child to where I'm taking them to someone that's healthy versus like everyone else in society that's already got a breathing problem. And this is where understanding all those things and having a doctor that understands that I think can really get perspective. And I think this is where like parents, like you said earlier, like people want it to be easy. It's not. Figuring out your health or my health is like figuring out a new planet. It's literally its own ecosystem. And people want to like be able to give it a pill. It's like, you know, you land on another planet. We send ships all the time. We've got NASA, the world's best scientists. And even them, they're like, dude, I don't know what I'm looking at right now. But I think we expect the doctor down the street to just figure stuff out in five minutes. And you're like, no. All right. A couple rapid fire questions on, on the things you just said. Number one, some of the things you mentioned, MMA, Sarpy, are, are all these things just basically palate expansion? So the tongue can, can sit on the roof of the mouth or are they different procedures? So a SARPI is a surgically assisted rapid palate expansion. The ease is like an endoscopically assisted palate expander. The mind M I N D from the breathe Institute is a palate expander. They just, from a hardware perspective, how they're put on like a, a bone born would be, or a tooth born would be like, this goes around the molars. Versus a bone born would be they put you under lightest anesthesia and they literally will put like bolt screws through your palate. So it's like hardcore on there. So when you talk about like asymmetry or structural issues, you know, obviously the more sturdy your foundation, the less torsion, the more you control the situation. And then I think like the MMA, which is the, it's full on surgery. Oftentimes, what they actually do is they cut like the back of the lower jaw and the upper jaw. And then they, it's like adding space between basically your back of your throat to widen the airway in the back. So it'd be like back here. So if like I could cut the upper and lower jaw and then just move everything forward, it's like I've created this space using metal plates and screws to just literally just make things physically bigger. So does this uh, quarterback or manager, does, does that exist out there or does each person or family need to be their own? I mean, this is what I've tried to do. My full-time job, I run a gym, I train athletes, but I think it's, I think it would just be a waste to take everything I've had to learn in order to help myself and then just not help other people. 
because I think some people don't have the time or the money that I had and they got to get it right the first time. So I think for me, it's been trying to basically just spend an hour with someone and help them understand the complexity, some of the best resources, how to go about approaching things. Because I think I can really give people a lot of the meat and potatoes over the course of an hour to help them understand what might matter, questions to ask, and how to go about approaching things. And outside of that, I mean, I think there are some quarterbacks depending on where you go. I think some of the best is like, uh, you know, my doctor, Dr. Avram Gold. He's, uh, I think, one of the best experts in the world for UARS. You know, because he's at a teaching hospital, he has an entire group of people that work with him. I think the Breathe Institute, you know, Dr. Zaghi, you know, they've got myofunctional therapists. He is an ENT as well as a sleep specialist. He has a surgeon. He has an ortho. He has a pediatric dentist with his wife. And you just realize like there's a few places that offer a lot of things. And I think that's where like for me, my gold standard for someone that's out of the country that needs help is always to reach out to the Breathe Institute because I think you know, Dr. Zaghi, you can have a sleep study from WatchPat1 mailed to your house and you can do a 15-minute call, whether you're in Dubai or Africa, it doesn't matter. And here you are, you get a chance to get at least 15 minutes from an analysis perspective. And then I think with some of these really good doctors today, I mean, one of my buddies is a strength coach for, the, for an NBA team. He literally flew in, had the procedure done at the Breathe Institute, and then he found an orthodontist back home to put his bite back together. So I don't think it's it's no longer if I, you grow up in a small town or you're somewhere that doesn't have access that you can't get the help you need. You might need to get on a plane a few times, but you know the ability to get cutting edge information and doctors with a cost to it there's now access to that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with the point you made earlier. It's, you know, there's ills with social media, but also it is a, a very cool time to be alive because, you know, not even a hundred years ago, it was just like, sorry, you know, unless you're in one of five cities in the world, um, you won't have access to these types of things. So that's a definite positive for anyone who's you know overwhelmed or hears this and is wondering, where to start. But I can certainly see why you're very popular online and why people reach out to you because it's a tremendous amount of information to triangulate. And um, I, I really resonate with it. This is exactly what inspired me to open my you know, health practice because I went to every type of functional provider and specialist and over time, you know, pieced together my own way of seeing things and there is a strategy and I do feel there's more streamlined ways to do it and just honestly peeling off the overwhelm for people can be half half the battle and set them up to to make strides forward so I can I can certainly see why you're probably a busy man in your your DMs but really appreciate you coming on and sharing all this if people want to follow more of your work what's the best way for them to do that yeah you could reach out via DM project airway um, I have the ability to kind of book consults. I always let people know I'm not a doctor, just gym owner turned concerned human looking to help others and share my knowledge. Uh, my gym, North Scottsdale, Premier Fitness Systems. You can feel free, reach out to the website. And then I think, yeah, as far as YouTube, I have the Project Airway. I don't have a ton of stuff on there. I have a few videos. And then my goal in the next, probably before the end of the year, is just putting together a course for parents that kind of encompasses all this. And I think the airway stuff has pretty been straightforward. But I think for me, my, the, the biggest thing I want to close the gap on is parents that really understand like the importance of like jaw health as it relates to nervous system and all these sensory processing issues that I think a lot of these kids have today, because it's very much tied to an airway that has support from a vision, hearing, balance. And I think, you know, you look at a lot of kids with sensory processing, autism, ADHD, and, you know, there are a lot of these kids are mouth breathers. They have nervous systems that are already taxed. They can't sleep. And then 
we can't get good intel if our tongue's not sitting on the roof of our mouth from uh, just a brain interference perspective. And all of these things matter. And I just don't think there's anyone out there talking about it. And I understand the complexity of it and why it matters because when you work with the best athletes in the world relative to sport, like that matters. And like helping those guys clean it up matters. And it's like, you want to give a kid a fighting chance today in this modern world and a nervous system and the ability to process information and have the right information rather than getting bad intel is critical for kids just developing skills and moving on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we will link to all that in the show notes. So if you're listening, you want to find Greg, find that course, find this material, just scroll down and click on whichever one you like. Greg, thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. 